Um, it's so great to see um, all of you here, uh, both familiar and uh, new faces. Um, I am delighted to be doing this. Um, and as you know, I'm usually the person kind of navigating a conversation, um, not being in the conversation. So um, I'm going to start showing you some images. What I've um, chosen are just a few selections from the many conversations we've presented over the past six-year period. Um, and um, I think we've had about over 100 speakers. And so this is a very select uh, selection. Um, just, I just wanted to show you a range. Uh, Julia will follow, and then we'll sit down and talk to each other. Um, so this is um, uh, a drawing by Gupi Ranganathan, um, and uh, you may have noticed a lot of her work is in the uh, um, outside area here. She, um, there's an exhibition of her work. Anyway, she was our very first conversation, and she was with scientist Erez Lieberman Aden. They worked together here at the Broad, uh, where she had been an artist in resident. Um, Aiden said that interacting with her led him to resolving the research he was already working on, helping him to see. And Gupi is still working on the body of work that has evolved from her interaction with the Broad researchers. Um, I'll I'll, going forward, I'll tell you the title of, of each um, conversation. So this was Engineering Science and Creative Collaboration. Installation artist Janet Eckelman and, and her engineer, Sam Boyer, were in conversation with filmmaker Sam Jury and her collaborator, science journalist Eli Kintich. And each artist with their re uh, respective collaborator engaged in a four-way uh, conversation. Um, reading Messages in the Natural World, Rosamund Purcell and Sven Burkitz. And Rosamund happens to be in the audience this evening. So photographer Rosamund Purcell was paired with literary critic Sven Burkitz, someone she was collaborating with. And channeling renowned uh, paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould, Sven read from the text of Bestiary, which is a beautiful book that was um, a collaboration between Gould and Purcell. Interspersed with the presentation of the text, Rosamund showed images and talked about her her most recent work as well. This is um, Into the Wind, uh, Georgie Friedman and Carrie Emanuel. So video installation artist Georgie Friedman and hurricane specialist Carrie Emanuel navigated the territory of storms and the sublime and shared their respective concerns and ideas about how storms affect us culturally, historically, and conversely the effects of human behavior on them. Many questions arose, among them, can art elevate our awareness and can science demystify phenomena as we seek to better understand what we do not understand? And something very interesting happened uh, during that program and it's always fascinating to me what happens that is completely unscripted, which is that Georgie Friedman grew up in, um, um, Louis in um, New Orleans and was not in New Orleans during Katrina, but her whole family was. So the, the conversation was, this incre was incredibly emotional, which of course I could not have anticipated. You know, emotions and hurricanes, I guess it kind of makes sense. Um, faces, genes, patterns, and stories, Alberta Chu and Murray Robinson. So filmmaker biologist Alberta Chu and researcher Murray Robinson um, this was then and still an ongoing project called Face Topo, stemming from their interest in the genetics of faces and a big question, a clear but genetically complex trait, could one's face possibly represent a visible proxy for one's genome? Is it possible to eschew the DNA part and just map the faces? 
So they set out to build a taxonomy of human adult faces by conceiving a global citizen project to crowdsource 3D face data. And there's, so this, their talk was a couple of years ago and they're still uh, working on this. Uh, creating Bridging, artist physicist Jeff Lieberman in conversation with Nobel physicist Alan Lightman. So they talked together about a range of topics, including religion and science. In connection with Alan Lightman's novel turned uh, pl into a play, Mr. G, which is a creation story. We presented the talk at the Underground Railway Theater, where the play was produced. Shown here is Jeff's amazing installation at the Biogen building in Kendall Square. Um, so this is a, a still, the, the sculpture moves um, over I think a 12 hour period. On beauty, Emily Evelith and David Tester. Painter Emily Evelith and software engineer and researcher David Tester explored the idea of beauty and how it resonates and overlaps in both of their worlds. As a way to focus this huge topic, they looked at aspects of truth, pattern, and ambiguity. Emily is an artist who makes beautiful objects, but is also interested in cultural notions of beauty. Subjective data, Natalie Maybeck and Ari Daniel. Maybeck uses data, specifically weather data, to create woven sculptural uh, structures and science radio journalist Daniel uses data to tell stories about scientists and science. For each, the data is used in an aesthetic and personal way. And in addition, some of Natalie's uh, physical works become musical instruments. Boundaries of the possible, Todd Macover and Kevin Esfeldt and just to explain, this image is something I found on the web. It is not specifically related to either of them, but um, it just sort of fit the boundaries of the possible. Um, in a world capable of destroying itself, composer Todd Macover and evolutionary biologist Kevin Esvelt were both interested, are both interested, in helping our society make big and imperative changes. Macover with his crowdsourced city symphonies and Esvelt with sculpting evolution which invents new ways to study and influence the evolution of ecosystems. They both continue to be compelled by what they discussed then. Theories, Things, and Creatures, Andrew Yang and Naomi Pierce. Um, this um, artist biologist Andrew Yang and Harvard biologist and butterfly curator Naomi Pierce explored many of their overlapping interests, among them animal perception, mutualism, and natural history collections. Their conversation alerted us to our place among all of the species on the planet. And I just want to explain quickly what this image is. So Andrew, artist biologist, uh, lives in Chicago. And he's um, there's a sort of citizen science pro uh, project there to collect birds who have um, killed themselves by running into tall glass buildings. So they're collecting the birds, um, bringing them back to the Field uh, Museum, where Andrew also works, opening them up and finding the seeds and, um, yeah, seeds that they have eaten. And so here is like one bird's, you know, intake. And then they're planting the seeds and kind of recycling them completely. So it's, um, you know, that's a beautiful kind of arrangement, but it's about this um, citizen science project that he's been working on for quite a while. So. Um, this land, Laura McPhee and Taylor Perron. Photographer Laura McPhee and geologist Taylor Perron shared their concern for the American landscape and how they each bring awareness to the evolution of land and landscape. McPhee's images invite contemplation about the unintended consequences of our attempts to control and manage nature and how we use the earth and to what ends. Perron uses fieldwork, remote imaging techniques, and computer simulations to discover how landscapes change through time. Poetry in the Ocean, Robert Pinsky and Stefan Helmreich. Poet Robert Pinsky and anthropologist Stefan Helmreich discussed, imagined, and invoked the ocean. 
Pinsky acted as the poetic voice through his choice of poems, the hub of the conversation, and Helmreich's comments and responses as the spokes. In this way, they summon the rich history of our relationship to the sea, both benign and dangerous. The voice of the poems iterated the sound of water. Thinking with the Body, Miriam Simon and Jody Weber. Researcher Miriam Simon, who investigates the implications, as she says, of socio-technical and environmental change with the project Training Transhumanism, or I Want to Become a Cephalopod, and choreographer and dance historian Jody Weber, who had, re who had then recently been thinking about how trees communicate, had a verbal and physical conversation looking at some of these questions. What does thinking with the body mean? What can we learn from animals? What can we learn from trees? And un unlike our other programs, the audience had the opportunity to move and think with their bodies. So there was, um, the conversation was actually this, physical. Uh, and I'm gonna end um, this with a piece by me, which is called Dissipate, Disappear series. Um, and I thought I would just share one of, one of my pieces, um, my practice, is in tandem with everything I do. Um, this is an installation view of an ongoing series shown here in an exhi exhibition at the Nesto Gallery. And these painted objects are accompanied by a very large, also ongoing group of drawings that capitulate the columns. And now Julia. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Julia Buntain Howell, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am a suburb of Boston native, but it's been about 15 years since I lived here, and I recently moved back. So, um, so one of the first people I reached out to was Deborah because we kind of knew each other, but not really. And she was one person in town I knew I wanted to get to know better. Um, so, so really glad to be here. I am the editor in chief and director of Sci Art Magazine and Center. I am also an artist. I occasionally curate shows. Um, I work at Pratt. I work at Rutgers. I do a lot of different things, but it's all under the same umbrella of science and art and what happens when they get together. So I'll just show you a few of my pieces to start um, because what I do professionally very much stems from my artistic, artistic practice, which was the first thing I started to do in the world of science and art. Um, Deborah, or Molly rather, mentioned that I got a double bachelor's in neuroscience and sculpture from Hampshire College. Um, while I was pursuing you know, a double bachelor's, it really ended up being that I started to make sculpture about the things I was studying in class in neuroscience. So that's when I started to make this kind of work. That was 10, 11 years ago. As an artist, I don't see a reason to do anything other than make work about the brain. There's a lot of territory there. Um, if you know anything about neuroscience, you know that we have a lot to discover about the brain. And it's a very good uh, decade and time for that sort of thing as our technologies get so advanced, we're able to see more and more, but still there's so much to discover. So this is from an exhibition I had at NYU last year. Um, the piece in the middle is based off of neuronal data that was acquired um, originally from a lab at MIT, and the pieces on the left and right are based on uh, microscopy photos I took um, while in a lab. Some of my other work is more sculptural. Um, so the things I like to explore as an artist include the beauty of biology, um, but also how science represents the brain. And if the representation of science has an aesthetic quality to it, which can be explored artistically. Um, so the top left photo is of these brainwave sculptures that I have. So what happens when you take two dimensional pixels, something that's normally on a screen, and, and you make it a line in space. That was the question I asked as an artist. Um, the bottom right photo are what, there are sculptures of what are called synaptic clefts. So that's the space between two neurons. That's the space of communication and exchange, and how weird it is that those spaces vary so much. So this is really recent data that's come out in the last couple of years. Um, I stay up to date on what's happening in neuroscience by reading the firsthand publications in, in the journals. Um, I often reach out to the scientists that I make 
uh, work with their data, and they're always like, oh, how cool is that? <laughs> uh, somebody cares about what I'm doing, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, other than my funding organization. Um, this is a piece, um, it's part of a series called Thoughts, where I've overlaid the cell bodies and neurons. Uh, I think this one is 23 overlaid cells. So in all of my work, I start with the hard science, and then I depart into the world of aesthetics. So the science is maintained throughout. There's no manipulation here of the form of the neurons. Of course, there's manipulation of color. There's manipulation of arrangement. But it's really important for me that some bit of science gets maintained throughout. And in the end, you have you know, an aesthetic experience. Maybe you dig into it further. Um, but yeah, so that's some of my work. But you know, as an, I'm, I, before I started doing anything else, I was very happy as an artist, but um, I had this kind of drive to do a little bit more than that. Um, I became and may still maintain a very specific interest in the relationship, in the kind of multi-directional relationship between art and science, science and society, and society and art. Um, I mean, there's a lot here. I'm not going to unpack all of it. but. Um, how do art and science relate to each other? How do they influence each other? What is the relationship between society and art and society and science? I'd say it's problematic right now. Is there anything art and science can do to improve each of their relationships with society or for each other? I think so. So these are some of the questions I try to address through my organizational work. Um, one thing we do at SciArt Center which is, I'll just pause for a moment and tell you about um, what that is. It's an organization, we are based primarily in New York, but we do events all over the place and we have a strong international community through a lot of the uh, programming that we do, which happens online. Um, so, you know, why let uh, national boundaries stop you from creating a collective, creating a group when we have this thing called the internet? Um, when we do physical programming, it's usually in New York, but sometimes other cities, and I'll get to that in a bit. This is from uh, one of our art shows. So we host art shows twice a year, and the theme changes, but it's always something related to science. Uh, this show was called The Void and the Cloud, and it related to science in a few different ways. One of them was the kind of uh, wave-particle duality, uh, another was the kind of digitization of everything up into the cloud. Um, so our artists took various takes on that theme. The guy talking right now is, um, he's a physics professor at uh, Blanking on the College in New York. He's, his name's Arthur Singer and he creates these beautiful kind of light reflective, refractive prints. Um, so we host these events twice a year. Uh, we either partner with an institution that likes our content or we have our own kind of pop-up short-term space. We're pop-up organizations, so we're kind of here and there and everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, this is from another show called Embodied. This was um, a couple years ago in Brooklyn. We popped up there and uh, this show was all about how different types of biological science have helped us understand ourselves in different ways. So how do you understand yourself on the level of the cell or the level of the molecule or the level of consciousness or the level of atoms? Uh, so artists in this show responded to that in different ways. All our shows are very eclectic. Um, they're always international and um, and they're always open calls. So if you're an artist and you're interested in submitting, just subscribe to our newsletter because we do open calls twice a year. We just finished an open call for the future of food, which is our next show happening in the spring, which I'm very excited about. Um, this show is up right now in uh, the New York Hall of Science, one of our host partners. Um, somebody in the room, Anna over there, is actually one of one of the artists in this show. This is a show on stem cell research and we curated it in collaboration with the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute in Cambridge, UK. Um, and so this was a really special opportunity to do it at a museum in collaboration with this international organization. The logistics of which you can imagine were a little complicated, but basically we got together this uh, group of 38 pieces all about stem cell research, ranging from 
being inspired by it to literally being a scientist that makes stem cell research and then visualizes their data and calls it art. So kind of the whole, the whole spectrum. A lot of our artists have dual degrees or moonlight you know, as an artist mm. by night while they're a scientist by day or vice versa. Um, another one of our programs that's recurring is our residency program. Uh, so we pair artists and scientists together to embark on a collaboration of their own devising. So this is, this is uh, the 24 people who have gone through our program. We have eight more in their residency right now. Um, we get in an open call of applications and we find pairs based on fitness across disciplines. Um, so to give you an example, let's see. Um, Brittany here was paired with Kara, who is right here. She is an entomologist and science communicator, and Brittany is a straight up artist interested in science, um, but had, had the sort of sculptural bend which Kara was interested in pursuing. And basically, I read their applications, and I was like, wow, these two would be really great together. And, uh, and they hit it off. And that's kind of what happens with every team, more or less. Um, the purpose of this program is to explore the potential of science art collaboration in general. We put no rules or expectations on the teams. We tell them we'll support you, we'll facilitate for you, we will problem solve with you for four months to see what, um, what your natural synergy generates. Uh, so sometimes for them it's a series of conversations that are meaningful. Sometimes it's an exhibition or um, or a movie or a performance, um, but it's it's always different, uh, and that's because we like to emphasize it's the process of collaboration which sticks with you throughout your entire life. An end product from a collaboration has a shelf life, but it's the process that changes your perspective and you carry forward with you. One of the aspects of the residency is that they keep a weekly blog, so we're also trying to archive the collaborative process. So every week the residents upload a blog and it's just like, this is what we did this week. And here's a sketch of a, a bug mask, I think is what they were working on at that point, um, for the sake of art and science communication. Um, we also do other kind of one-off programming or not annual, but, but recurring programming. Uh, we held a conference um, about a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, exploring various aspects of the science art convergence. Um, we also have a recurring book club now, and, um, and we're going to be starting up a laser, which is a cross-disciplinary talk series, in the spring with another institution in Cambridge called Swiss Next. Um, so I mentioned we mostly do programming in New York. Well, that will change come spring, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, the other aspect of the SciArt organization is our magazine. We're no longer called SciArt in America because they got upset about that, they being Art in America. Um, <laughs> I assured them, no, no, we haven't made any money that you would have made. Um, we're a free publication, because at that point we were. We no longer are entirely free, but it was a very funny exchange. Um, we're not now SciArt magazine. We also have more of a global focus than we did when we started in August 2013. This is our issue cover from back then. We also used to do print. Now we are an online publication. We have modernized um, into the digital age where you can read it on your phone, you can read it on your tablet or your computer. Um, we publish about science-based art, third culture conversation, STEAM education, um, and the like. We take submissions, so about 50% of our content is submission-based now. So I say you know we publish about these three things, but really it's like, we could publish about something that falls into a new category tomorrow if somebody sends me an email. Um, of course, you know, there's, there's a filter process, but um, some of these things up right here. Uh, we, like, we have a heavy um, focus on interviews because I really, I think often what people have to say about their own work, whether it's artistic or scientific, is more interesting than what someone else could say about their work. Um, it's just a way to get a deeper insight into the kind of behind the scenes story. So we publish every other month. We're coming out with the December issue as soon as it's finished, very soon. <laughs> um, but find us online, sciartmagazine.com. Um, so yeah, all of this sci-art stuff was born out of my artistic practice, my need and want to explore how science and art can interact. And I won't go on too long about that because Deborah and I will talk all about that. But I will leave this up here for you. Thank you. Great. <laughs>
Thank you, Shannon. Um, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> um, I think what I'm going to do is um, start our conversation with reading our mission statements, our kind of formal, uh, our formal statements to the world of what we're doing, and then we can sort of unpack it. That and, sounds great. Yeah. And, um, yeah, as we, we talked about, we'll also start with a question that each of us will answer, and then we'll just let it go. As usual, I have a lot prepared, but we can ignore it or follow it. I so. mean, we could stay here for the next five hours. Yeah, That's... no, we can't. <laughs> okay, so Julia's, um, yours reads, artists and scientists seek answers to the same fundamental questions. Who are we, why are we here, and where are we going? Both art and science build models of human experience in order to extend the boundaries of human capacity. Despite this common ground, artists and scientists are too often separate in their endeavors. So I think we both resonate with, with that and trying to put things together. Um, ours reads, Catalyst Conversations presents intimate and provocative conversations between artists, scientists, and the public, sparking collaborations, synergy, and the development of future projects with these communities and beyond. So the first question I'd, I'd like us both to respond to is, when did you first gain interest working in the intersection between arts and sciences? So kind of that from a personal point of view, and I'll, I'll answer first, sure. which is um, I have a, had, I think, a very good liberal arts education. And I think that led me to being curious, thinking critically, uh, sort of no matter no matter what the topic, so I trained as a as an artist, but I was always cont and continued to be interested in kind of everything. And I also I uh, was really thinking about this. Um, so I've always mostly read nonfiction, and I happen to be the granddaughter of um, a, a really she has passed um, a, a wonderful person who was a medical doctor who I think instilled in all the grandchildren, um, you know, really, you know, fulfilling your potential. But we also used to read science together. Um, for example, um, one of her favorite authors was Lewis Thomas, and we read that together. I don't know if people are familiar with Lewis Thomas, who uh, was a marvelous writer and uh, also a medical doctor. Anyway, I think, I think that was kind of a, like a seed that um, was planted early on. And um, yeah, so that's kind of that part, of, part of, of the beginning story. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, yeah, I think a lot of us have a person or a moment or a teacher that, you know, so what's, what's your response to that? Yeah, so my moment, um, it was a specific moment, uh, of course, during some moments, you don't realize what they'll turn into, but in mm -hmm. hindsight, everything is 2020. Um, so I was literally running between the lab and the studio in college. If you're not familiar with Hampshire College, you design your own major and you don't get grades. Um, you can do literally anything you want as long as you do it very well. Uh, that's the kind of bar that's set there. So it was a very interesting place to come into kind of my intellectual and creative um, adulthood. Um, I knew I liked art. I always did art. I went to an arts high school. That was kind of a given. I wasn't sure how much I liked it, but I, I knew it was something that came naturally to me. Um, but uh, I didn't know I liked neuroscience until I tried out a neuroscience class, and um, I was coming from a, a place, a mental place, where I was very interested in things like uh, the pharmaceutical industry and mental illness and emotion. You know, it's kind of typical for teenagers. Um, but it, it, I, was, I, I was reading a lot of nonfiction books about this sort of thing, and then I walked into this neuroscience class and was like, oh, here's all the hard science behind the stuff that I've been kind of casually thinking about and reading about. And the tangibility of the science uh, grabbed me because um, I'm a kind of maker by heart, so I like tangible things, and, uh, and so that made a lot of sense in retrospect. But there was one moment where I was studying for an exam. This was a class at Smith College, um, which we were allowed to take classes at, so I did have to take some tests, like 
board tests in college. It was terrible. Um, studying for this really hard exam at Smith, and um, I was just trying to get the, get the flow of the blood through the heart down pat. N not very complicated, but it was one of many, many things I had to memorize that day. And, you know, I'm looking at the diagrams in the textbook, and it's like, okay, well, I'm not, really not going to remember this unless I draw it out, because that's just how I intake information the best. And so I started making these little anatomical flashcards, and I started to get way into, like, way too into, like, coloring them in certain, you know, I was like, all right, this is beyond, like, test help. This is, like, fun. Um, and that's when I realized, wow, there's, there's something to this about visualizing the science that I'm studying, not like what I made was, was anything special, but it just lit that little idea in my mind. And then it wasn't too soon after that that I started to make art about what I was most interested in, which was you know, cellular neurobiology at that point. So. Very good, a different kind of answer than me, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hated yeah. science in high school. I, I mean, I hated it in the dumb way where you hate something you don't know anything about. It's like, oh, it's boring. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't yeah, I, an enlightened I, yeah, point of view. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't particularly uh, good in science in, in school, so maybe this is all, you know, overcompensating <laughs> later, right? So Maybe. <laughs> yeah, was, Julie and I were chatting before. I feel like I've, um, you know, I've learned so much. I feel like I'm like have earned at least one PhD by doing this. You know, just a straight up learning curve. So uh, another thing we had been talking about, uh, which is the sort of creation story. You know, maybe the more personal story of starting our organization. So I'll tell mine first, which yeah. is I ran into Clara Wainwright. I, maybe people know who Clara Wainwright is. She's um, was ahead of her time. She's um, still very much around. She um, is a fabric artist and, she, among other things, invented First Night. Anyway, I, I ran into her at an opening and we, I didn't know her very well. We started chatting and um, I was just telling her, like, I was fascinated, which I still am, the, the interest of artists in, in science, not just visual artists, but dancers and musicians and so on. And um, she was talking about how it would be great to have a forum in the Boston area for all the artists to, you know, to have a place where there's conversations. And anyway, that is exactly how the idea got born. And she said, we're going to have lunch. So if Clara asks you for lunch, <laughs> that's what you do. And um, it, it, it quickly evolved from there. So um, with Clara and with her kind of mentorship, you know, we developed a group of people who have interested in a lot of research. And uh, about a year later, um, we launched, and um, to my surprise, that was not the only thing that would happen. It that was the very first thing, and that became that seeded, you know, six years six years later. So. Who knows what a lunch can lead to? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the the magazine for Sci Art came first. Um, I had had a kind of secret side interest in the publishing world um, that I explored mainly through unpaid internships at various points in my life. Um, and uh, I never, you know, I never knew where those internships would take me, but, but it, they ended up being very relevant because I realized through working for different publications that were successful or not, um, that gathering together information that I thought was important was something that I enjoyed. Um, I like, and that's a lot of what I do now through SciArt is bringing the right different you know, things together. This is what you do yes. when you curate conversations. Yes. It's like bring this and this and this. And it's, there's something that feels really good about doing that on the personal level, but then you kind of let it out into the world and then mm -hmm. it does its own thing and, and then it serves everybody else and they get interaction back and so, so I, I realized I liked that about publishing. The internet's like such a crazy place. I mean it's even crazier than when I started the magazine in 2013. So when you decide to collect information in a meaningful way, it gives it a little bit of a, a step up from the din of the internet. So, so that's why I started the publication. Um, instead of starting something else. Um, I, uh, I was halfway through grad school and I thought to myself, okay, I'm an artist interested in science. I know a bunch of other artists interested in science, but I felt like there was a little bit of a lack of 
presence despite the numbers. It, there didn't feel like there was a cohesive presence or at least the kind of presence that I was looking for. Um, so a publication is a way to do that, a way to raise awareness about, hey, these people are doing all this amazing stuff. Read about it, know about it, get in touch with them, and it has a kind of um, rolling ball effect after that. So yeah, and then the events and the art shows and everything um, kind of naturally evolved from that because we got a lot of positive feedback um, and uh, we, people started to ask us, oh, can you host other kinds of things? I'm like, well, we're a magazine. We don't like host events, but, but maybe we can grow and, and have another branch of what we do. So, um, so yeah, I've worked with different people along the way and um, who, who helped make that happen. Yeah. So just um, in response to kind of both of us, um, most artists, are working alone and it seems like it's kind of a leap of faith to go from that kind of interior you know kind of singular uh, activity to collaboration and kind of a, a broad you know a, a broad connection to community and for me that's been um, has been very rewarding and, and kind of an aspect that I didn't, you know, I didn't like say now that's why I'm doing it, but it's a kind of a natural aspect. And to, to have an idea and to manifest it, it's also what happens when I curate. It's here's an idea about beauty. Let's, let's do an right. exhibition. Let's do a talk about ideas about beauty, which is very complicated and, <laughs> and fraught. And um, especially if you don't believe that art should be beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So in fact, <laughs> some that's people why out there. <laughs> Emily Eveleth and I um, had a bunch of conversations before her conversation about beauty. So let's do this. You know, let's <laughs> talk about it. And uh, it, that actually led to um, me curating an exhibition about beauty. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, I think that's really interesting. And I, I also think that perhaps for both of us, it was like, you know, kind of a certain synergy out in the world of this being the right moment for doing this. So in Cambridge, Boston area, there are many, you know, every day of the week, there's like, you know, probably 10 talks that, yeah. about science or art or both. And, um, but I think that what Catalyst are doing is, is you know, fulfilling a, like a particular kind of space um, and continues to do so. and. You know, get, we get along with other people doing doing programming, um, but it's it's not something that is planned exactly. You know. Well, I, I think that's I I've had my eye on Catalyst for a few years now. I didn't get to come to one until this past I don't know, September October. Yeah, October um, yeah. But but it's an organ. So one thing I do as someone who leads an organization is I make friends with other organizations because it's a small world and the camaraderie thing is the way to go, mm -hmm. uh, not competition. Uh, in the science art world, it's um, there are too many other obstacles to overcome. <laughs> we don't need to make more problems for ourselves. So so I, meeting other other people who are heading organizations is the best because there's not only this exchange of you know, ideas, but, but also like I, one of the reasons I've always loved Catalyst is because it, it uh, supports and fosters spontaneous dialogue. You know, we've all been to one too many kind of talks where there's just the PowerPoint and it's very scripted. And while those can be very informative and very good for a particular function, um, art, the art and science talk, there's so much room for spontaneous dialogue. There's so much to explore that, you know, we don't need to script ourselves right. all and the time. I, as I was saying yeah. when I was showing the few examples that there are things that happen in, the com in these kind of conversations that, you know, you don't know are going to happen or you don't anticipate or it's very emotional or, yeah. or there's like this kind of poetry that happens. And in fact, I just want to share with you that the Robert Pinsky, uh, Stefan Helmreich talk, Poetry in the Ocean, um, was something I dreamt. I dreamt poetry in the ocean, and I woke up and thought, I'm just, that's perfect. I'm going to ask Robert Pinsky and find, you know, uh, Stefan Helmreich, who's an anthropologist who studies uh, people who study the ocean, and it was, it was quite amazing. You know, that's so, so cool. Yeah. I wish I had dreams like that. <laughs> once, once in a while, you know, once in a while. Um, well, I wanted to ask you, um, so you've had maybe 100 or so speakers over, what, 50 or so events or something like that. Yeah. yeah. 
what, what uh, this, I mean, this is an unfair, horrible question. What was your favorite one? Or, or what's one that stands out in your mind for a particular reason? Yeah. There are many that where I was sort of touched by, by the interaction of the speakers and, and the subject matter. But uh, there was one that um, sort of stands out, which uh, was I invited Stan Strickland, uh, who I consider a Boston treasure. He's an amazing musician and thinker. And I had him in conversation with Ani Patel, who's a neuroscientist who studies music. And they were, it was almost as if the words were like not good enough. And it was like they had this musical connection that was, was profound. And, you know, the audience, and I had spent a lot of, you know, like I do, a lot of time preparing and talking and whatever. And I was completely like transported by by their kind of conversation, which was both, you know, verbal, they were talking to each other, and musical. Stan did a, I don't know if anyone here was, yeah, wasn't that, a, it was amazing, right? Uh, <laughs> and he did this, he just sort of, he did, instead of showing slides, he did like this breathing thing, like he, his whole body was like a musical instrument. And then Ani Patel was talking about the cockatoo that he was like researching, and <laughs> who, um, and I think it was deeply felt by the, the audience because we all have that kind of internal sense of rhythm. We all have music inside of us. It's very and powerful. It, and yeah. it's <laughs> profound. And um, yeah, so I would say that was one where there was, you know, this kind of moment of like everyone like kind of aha. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, you know, even as much preparation as you do, anything could happen, you know. Yeah, so that would be a standout okay. for me. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we started, uh, or I started, just with um, visual artists, because that's what I am. But we have happily expanded to poets. We've had dancers. We've had um, theater people, um, musicians, and, and continue with visual artists. And um, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In my. Uh... In, in the work that we do, it's there are more visual artists than there are any other kind of artists, so they naturally with us have a kind of distinct presence in terms of what our programming looks like, but, um, but we publish and work with people in dance, theater, music, writing, certainly. I mean, it's, it's silly to think writers don't engage with this. Think about the genre of science fiction um, starting in the 19th century. Um, and, and yeah, some of the dance and theater especially that's coming out um, mm. is, it's just phenomenal. And I, I love the performing arts because one, I'm, I'm not a performing artist, so my ability to judge it or critique it is you know, pretty low, as opposed to visual art where I'm very critical. <laughs> so I, I really could just go and you know, enjoy it and long for the ride. Um, but also with, with things like music, it's, uh, you know, you can walk by a painting and kind, you know, you choose your level of engagement, but, but music especially, it's, uh, it gets right into you. Mm. And, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we've had several, I'd say all the mu musicians we've had in conversation have been highlights. You know, yeah. Really interesting. Not surprised. <laughs> so um, this might be a good moment to engage you all if you would like to ask questions or comments or anything. And Megan has a microphone. Hi. Um, one of the things that I can see that science and art have in common is they both sort of have a philosophical purity where you pursue an objective for its own sake rather than trying to produce some result demanded by somebody else. And I think one step towards the results demanded by somebody else from science is probably engineering, and from art maybe is craft. And I think there's a sense, well, I wondered if you've thought about how engineering, or for a scientist, how engineering fits into this relationship between aesthetic and intellect, and maybe for an artist, is there anything about craft? I mean, craft, you know, I, I went to school, had an art department, and craft was kind of like, eh. Yeah, but, I mean, des design might be a good example right, well, of that as well. Right, yeah, yeah. In, illustration and, and, fine art and painting or something. Um, but anyway, uh, 
maybe engineering. What role does en where does engineering fit into this relationship between science and art? So I'll I'll just quickly answer, and then maybe you have also a response. But um, the the artists, some of the artists that we've um, presented, and artists that I know who are working on a large scale public art scale, like Janet Eckelman, she has like a, I mean I think. He's employed by her. She has a full-time engineer who helps her realize her ideas. So I think she has, you know, she's kind of the visionary, and then her engineer, um, Sam Boyer, is um, the person who actually, you know, manifests or figures out how that thing is going to yeah. you know, stay stay up. Um, and I, there are other. I, I mean, know, this is it's mm. it's increasingly true. Any big piece of art that you see and, you're, yeah. and you have that feeling, wow, how is that made? It's made by engineers. Um, and, and probably more than one. You know, yeah, a, probably, a probably a team that's led by an artist that's collaborating with engineers or they're hired or something like that. You know, she um, put up the example of that hanging ball sculpture that Jeff, Jeff Lieberman. Lieberman yeah. So I actually used to work for that company that made that or was one of the companies that made that. And, um, and the company is an sculpture company founded by an engineer who was more interested in aesthetics than functionality. Um, so I think there's a huge space for engineers to, you know, do things which are functional, but, but, um, but maybe functional in the artistic way, yeah. Right, yeah, I think Jeff Lieberman is probably someone that uses all those. Is Definitely. Right? And who had an amazing conversation with Alan Lightman about religion. Yeah. It was like, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, Carrie. I probably don't need this, but um, in the, this is for you, Julia, the, uh, your last issue of Sci Art Magazine, I'm still used to calling it Sci Art in America. Yeah, we all are. <laughs> Um, you really explored the issue of relationships between artists and scientists where the artist wasn't just mm. uh, illustrating the work of the scientist. And you were yeah. asking the question of how can, at what levels beyond that can the artist and scientist influence each other and influence the viewer. And I'd love you to talk about sure, that. Sure, yeah. Um, so we, every, about once a year, we do a special topics issue where we, uh, normally the content's kind of about this thing or that thing, but, but once a year we gather content specifically around a central issue or idea. So this past October was, uh, how can art influence science? So this question assumes that it can. So that, that was an assumption which I, I made based on a few anecdotes I had heard over the years of trying to collect these stories, but there, there wasn't a, a thing which had collected all of them. And importantly, um, most of the anecdotes were not written by the person whose story it was. It was written by someone who had heard it from somebody else. So, so I was just kind of fed up with uh, not having the hard evidence, as it were. Of course, it's qualitative evidence. It's stories. It's not a study. But, but it's a collection of 17 stories by scientists. So it's um, an art magazine written by scientists, which is funny in itself, um, all about how um, art or engagement with the arts directly influenced their research and science. So the the good example for this context here is the Vice Institute just down the road. Um, Don Ingber heads that up, and um, he was the discoverer of something called cellular tensegrity, which is an architectural property of how cells hold themselves together. Um, this made his career and uh, his impact on the field of biology you know, can't be described. Um, he made this discovery because he took a sculpture class as a freshman, you know, and it's, yeah. there was a line of thought from this sculpture class, from something, a sculpture he was introduced to, studying Buckminster Fuller's forms, and then something he saw in the lab. There was a kind of connection that he made because all those things happened at the same time. And it wasn't to say his discovery was accepted immediately or the road wasn't hard, but, but that is the story that he tells. And, um, and so we have a bunch of stories like that because, yeah, a lot of the work that I do, it's, you know, 
arts using the science as, as a subject matter, but I think the other way around, the other direction of influence is very interesting, is less explored, um, has a lot of potential. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We're starting to see, you know, artists in residence at the Broad Institute. I think that's really interesting and um, potentially very fruitful for scientists. So, yeah, yeah it's agree. an exciting area. Yeah. I'm sure the Broad would agree with you. And I was, my anecdote of Goopy with Eris Lieberman Aiden yeah. was he, like, he had an aha with, with her because she was responding to his, uh, his research and did something that led him to to be able to make a resolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Anybody else? So my question is on Instagram, actually, which I think is the way that most people my age or younger are consuming art nowadays, which is scrolling and seeing something. And there's a scientific process to how each of us is shown certain artwork, whether that's an algorithm, um, whether that's advertising or something like that. So my question for you is whether either of you have explored kind of the, not scary, but fear that a lot of us have about how um, scientific processes mapped through technology that become permanent can influence our consumption of art. Oh, that's a terrific question. <laughs> my, my immediate response is, um, which I might change my opinion about this in a few years, but my opinion right now is that um, people always choose their way of engaging with art, and Instagram is another way to engage with art. Like some museums don't allow you to take photos because they Maybe they're worried about the artwork, but you know, some people are looked down on if you take a photo while you're in a gallery. I take photos of everything because guess what? I want to look at them later and like remember and, and all of that. Um, do I think Instagram's the best platform to look at art? No, it's always in person. Um, but at least things are getting more exposure. I don't know. And some people are making a career out of it, which I'm too old to understand how that works. <laughs> it's interesting. I um, just cured in an ex. Uh, an exhibition at Suffolk University Gallery, and all of the artists in the show are painters, and it, their work is very much about material, but they're all on Instagram, and it's like, it's like an imperative for them. That's how they sort of think and function, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think it's a, a, an ongoing, or it's, it remains unanswered, your question. Yeah, yeah I think it's in progress, and yeah. Maybe we have time for maybe two more. So uh, I could be one of your teams because I'm a mathematician and I'm an artist. <laughs> and the idea that people will speak and, and, and some inspiration or word as the intuitive uh, source of, of uh, inspiration for that biologist came from. He could have been uh, talking to uh, structural engineers and, and get the idea of extracellular uh, matrix. Uh, so the idea of that people will speak to each other and it will be inspiring and Pinsky will be inspired when he speaks to somebody about the ocean is, 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 is of course, very appealing. I would be happy to be one of those with more than myself yeah. every evening. but. Then I question, where, where does things become art? So for 10 years, for example, I was engaged with people who were doing fluid dynamics. And if you go to the American Physical Society conference on fluid dynamics, you will see pictures that are marvelous. They image various aspects of flow, it's marvelous. And if you go to solid mechanics, you will see other marvelous pictures, and if you'll go to people who are interested in dynamical systems, you'll see marvelous pictures. If you look at the Grand Tetons, you'll see beautiful. The, the question is, where does it end being uh, uh, imaging that has uh, yeah. an aesthetic quality, and what does it become artist? Because uh, I can flood your uh, magazine and, and 110 others, or a thousand others, and with beautiful pictures, and pictures that have reminiscent of, of the, you know, neural structures or whatever. Um, 
They will be beautiful. Are they out? They, they, they have deep aesthetic quality. To them. Well, you are you are asking an age-old question, <laughs> which I'm not sure Deborah and I can answer in the next three minutes, but. Um, I don't know what camp you fall in. I fall in the camp of intentionality. If, and this is because of Duchamp. So if you say it's art because you say, I'm an artist when I made this and I want you to look at it like it's art, who am I to say anything otherwise? Whether it gets in a magazine is you know, an editorial choice. But, but it's, there are so many beautiful scientific images out because all these advanced imaging techniques, not only in fluid dynamics, but in, I mean, neuroscience, you know, these big colorful brain, rainbow, all that stuff that happened at Harvard. Um, we actually asked the, the lead guy on rainbow whether he thought his images were art. And he was like, I have no idea. Like, maybe, but people like buy posters and hang them up for pleasure. And yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's very interesting though. It's definitely, well, yeah. yeah. I guess I would echo <laughs> Julia, and I was just thinking about the you know the exhibition, the beautiful brain at the um, MIT museum. No, go Cabral, see that if you have not seen it. The Cabrel, you know, they're just stunning, and they were really just you know he was it was his investigation of of the, of the brain of neurons. Um, so, but he was an artist on the side which is why he was able to yeah. do such delicate drawings. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe a, a beautiful representation of water is a thing into itself. You know, it's yeah. both, maybe it's both, you know. You know, a la, a la Leonardo, I would say, you know, his, those drawings of water are, were, you know, very specific. He was really trying to find out something and they're aesthetic at the same time, so. I, I want to ask a follow-up question. Um, often when people talk about science, they refer very carefully to the process of science mm. rather than the, the, the tentative knowledge created by science, which is, which is its product. I, I'd like you to think about answering his question, thinking about art not as I walked into this room, thinking about it as products that I experienced, but as the process. Mm. Um, and I'd be curious if you, if you talked about process, how, how would you then answer that question? Good question, great question. Um, so for me as an artist, I have um, a very uh, sort of deep interior self. That's the best way I can describe it. And there is something that I have that I'm always pursuing. It's like a shape or a, a color or a, a something. I can't, you know. And that is the driving force for me of the process of making something. And I have to make those things so that I can see what I'm thinking about. And I, I um, mentioned my kind of uh, liberal arts education. So I'm also like a research person. So if I'm like thinking about the void or let's just say sublime or some, some big topic that I think that work could be sort of part of that conversation, then I do a lot of reading and a lot of research and you know. But I think it's, it's that that, and I think in scientists too, you know, you have to be like repeating the experiment or, or the, you know, going through that process till you understand what you're doing. You don't know it until until the process is, it's not finished ever, it's, it's always ongoing, you know. And, and I'd say just, this is just kind of parenthetical for me, I always think, oh, I'm on to like something really new and it's like this, you know, that was 20 years ago, I was interested in like that shape or I'm interested in that shape and then I go visit my grandfather's grave and there's that shape and, you know, you, you, you have to be in that place of, of sort of paying attention and things kind of, um, connecting. I think we have time for one more question. Susan. Um, Julia, you've expanded your organization into several different types of activities, you know, shows, your residency, and that sort of thing. Deborah, what do you see in the future for Catalyst Conversations? Um, <coughs> So these great questions, I will tell you, it's very specific. So we've been doing this for six years uh, at a certain level, um, which is changing now. We're actually becoming um, 
we are our own nonprofit um, organization. Uh, anyway, w with that and with having, I think, sort of proven our kind of uh, worth, um, what, I, what I really w am looking forward to and want to have happen is to turn this or to augment these conversations, which I think unto themselves are pretty interesting, but to do an um, educational, um, to do educational outreach with STEM, rather, excuse me, STEAM education and connect these kind of conversations with uh, workshops and, and so on. The other thing I'd like, to, and we did one, is to also take what we're doing here um, and do it specifically um, for companies so that it, it's part of um, the uh, Novartis or you know name your company um, for their staff as a way of kind of um, you know uh, an augmented educational experience. So that's that's one of the things. And I, I want to continue to do these you know free and open to the public. But it just feels like the next the next thing should happen. You know m more activity, um, just more activities. So I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, I want to thank Julia and you for uh, being thank here you, and Deborah. being part of the conversation. <laughs> And um, just um, a little bit of Catalyst News. We've now uh, completed six podcasts for our listening to Catalyst, and Julia is one of our podcast people. Um, we're working on a really uh, interesting spring season, so check our website for updates and mailing list, catalystconversations.org. Um, I'd like to recognize our many wonderful volunteers and members of our advisory and now our new governing board. Um, we couldn't do anything we do without you. Um, thank you so much to the Broad for hosting us, and thanks all ag again for coming. So, thank you.